And joining us right now is the new manager of the New York Mets, Buck Showalter. Buck, it's Carton and Roberts here on the fan in New York City. Congratulations and welcome. How are you? Good. How are we doing, guys? How's everybody today? How's the weather up there? Where are you? I am in Dallas, Texas right now, with the key word being right now. Why, you guys live in Dallas? Yeah, 20 years. I promised my kids when we moved uh, with the Rangers that uh, they could go. My son went to high school and college here at TCU over in Fort Worth and went to high school here. My daughter went to SMU, Southern Methodist, went to law school there. So it was kind of a promise to them after all the moving around that, plus the airports, direct flights everywhere. So, and quite frankly, guys, the state ta- income tax is a lot better. <laughs> yeah, I, so, I, I that hear part. you, though. So the idea is, listen, I got kids who are still in, like, grade school, elementary school, high school, whatever. Dad's rarely around it anyway because of the baseball season. Why disrupt their lives? Let them have a home base, and I'll make sure I'm there as much as possible. I totally get that. Now they're, now they're uh, two and a half miles away from my son lives up in Annapolis. Uh, with William and Nathaniel the fifth, you think he had some pressure on him to deliver that mail, <laughs> or, that, or his wife did, I should say. More her than when, him for sure. Speaking of you... wives, I have to ask you. For a minute there, I thought your wife was being held under duress, and I suggested she should blink twice if she needed help. But uh, it was—I've never seen a press conference like that before. Is she excited about the move to New York as well? Well, she's got no choice, right? <laughs> no, I mean, she better be. No, I'm just kidding. She's been uh, she's been a rock, okay? And, uh, you know, they asked if she would want to come on, and she stuck it out. So uh, it's kind of in a nutshell. She's right here beside me. I ask her a question if you want. But, no, I, I, uh, there's a reason why you stay married for 38 years, guys, okay? Did- it ain't – it's not always perfect, but uh, you, it's about some of the same things that we hope the Mets – can be about it's about commitment to uh, to things. I tell players all the time: the hardest thing you're ever going to do in your life is be a good father and be a good husband. You know, so if you take some of those practices and put them into your baseball world, you might be a little more successful. When you get home after a game, instead of listening to the second guessing from the fan, does your wife do that? Will she tell you, "Listen, what the heck were you doing?" Second and third, bottom of the seventh. Like, is she a second guesser when it comes to the decisions you make while managing? Well, she understands timings, everything. There's a time and place. She has a curiosity. She wants to believe me. Nobody's going to want the Mets to win. Uh, she's been around it. She understands strategy, and um, she deflects a lot of things. You know, believe me, she's had her share of tough trips to the grocery store. Uh, when the mm. cashier is not happy with last night's game, she's very experienced about it. So I'm sure. All right, um, so let's get into a couple things here as we talk to the new manager yeah. of the Mets, uh, Buck Showalter. Um, th- it seemed to me, Buck, that more than any other time since you last managed, there was this overwhelming support amongst people involved with the sport, whether they be former players, current quote unquote insiders or analysts that you had to get this job. And I wonder, you had to be aware of it because you're in the media, you get, you know what that world's like. Do you have any idea where that came from? And as you started to be aware of it, how did you react to that, that you became you know, their choice, that people calling up the Mets saying, you know, Buck's the guy, Buck's the guy, Buck's the guy? Well, you know, first of all, you know, I try to stay away from that as much as I can. But, I, you know, some things, you know, my wife and my kids would deliver stuff they thought that I needed to know about, and I tried not to read anything. But, you know, it was very humbling. Quite frankly, at the time, it was a little uncomfortable because I know one of the things appealing to me, I saw who Billy and Sandy were talking to by word of mouth, and it was very impressive. I knew they were after the right guys and to be one of those people. But, you know, at the end of the day, someone took a chance on me too, guys, a long time ago. And I'd have been the first one to call whoever got the job. And, um, you know, I'm going to try to reach out to some of the people I know they were talking to. And it was very close. Believe me, I know Sandy and Billy and, it, you know, whether at the very end, you know, when I left Steve's house, I'm sure they had a long conversation about what direction they wanted to go after gathering all the information. When you're there, you know, the background tests and everything they were very diligent about. Oh, my gosh. You know, I, I had calls from people saying, you're not going to believe who called me today about <laughs> you off the field and all the other <laughs> stuff. I told my wife, I said, honey, you got to, you got to understand that I must be okay now because they've checked every box. <laughs> right. 
When, when you're at Steve's house and you're talking to Billy Epler and Sandy Alderson, what's the main topic of conversation? Like, what are, you know, as you're interviewing for the job, and I'm sure part of it is you're interviewing them. You want to see, do I want this job? Do I want to manage? What's the big topic of discussion that's happening most of the time? Well, I would like to have been about the art collection. Oh, my God. <laughs> wow. Sure. Okay. I, I got. I did get a little tour afterwards. My gosh, is that impressive? Yeah. So, um, I think it was. It was so far ranging. There were three or four stages to it, and uh, they were very thorough. They had done their homework, and uh, yeah, it's a very precious commodity. The New York Mets that fans and and Steve care about and love, and you know, to have that entrusted in you, I think they just wanted to make sure that you shared the same passion. Fort and uh, you know you hear a lot of things and you know I'm at a stage in my life I ain't getting out of this a lot none of us are that's just you know you want to be a part of something special I wanted to make sure that uh, you know what I could potentially bring was going to share in the collaboration of, of the end game we're trying to get to you know today's game has always has been about a collaboration back with Gene Michael and you know now with with Billy and Sandy and Steve uh, it's a collaboration none of us are that smart but. You know, we do share. I just wanted to see if we all shared the same passion for, you know, where we wanted to go and how we were going to go about it. The the perception is the collaboration is more like that today than it ever was. Now, you've managed a a lot of teams in a lot of different decades. Is the job the same? Like, is managing, I'll use Texas, or the Diamondbacks, is that the same job as the job that you're taking today being a manager of a baseball team, or is it changed in a major way? I think this will be more like that as terms of you know there was not a more collaboration than one i had with gene michael that i had with john hart i mean these guys i knew that things i know the the farm system the scouting department that everybody was on task and i didn't have to worry about anything but managing the club and then some places like arizona you do what they ask you to do you know i'd love to just manage a team like i had to in new york and for instance, Texas, but they ask you to be involved in other things. So you just bring what they ask you to bring. I don't have to worry about that here. I got to, I got to manage the New York Mets. Those 25 guys in the locker room and 40 guys on the roster. I know they have very capable people and Billy and Sandy and a great owner and Steve and even his wife, Alex, is very impressive. She loves, you know, she's going to be a, a great force for us off the field. And, uh, you know, I knew the farm system and the scouting department. A mistake people make is coming into something that didn't wasn't the last team standing and thinking everything there is bad. It's not. You know, I just got to embrace it and see if we can get it headed in, in the same direction. When you say collaboration, I think with some organizations we get the impression – that everyone's kind of voting, and that's how a decision's being made. Like, who's going to start, you know, a a game five in the Dodgers series? In your case, are you the ultimate decider? Like, if you want to make a decision, is it ultimately up to you, or is it everyone's got a seat at the table and we're going to decide together what we want to do here? After the game, it is. (laughs) You know what I mean? Hey, listen, you you wear things, and I'm okay with that. You know, there's what's that thing about be careful about telling truths that hurt innocent people. There, you know, everybody's going to have input. And at the end of the day, we'll make a decision as a group. You know, the greatest accolade you can pay a man is to ask his opinion on something. You may not particularly care for it going in, then all of a sudden you go, wow, that was pretty good. I just want to have pure-hearted people. You know, it's, it's real simple. It's not as complicated as we make it. And um, believe me, baseball exposes phonies in a, in a heartbeat. There's, and, there's, uh, a, there's the thought, though, Buck, that in, in the, the world we live in today in Major League Baseball – that decisions are made uh, outside of the manager's purview. And I guess the question is, you know, we were, we were talking before you came on the air about if I'm Buck Showalter, what question do I have for Billy, Sandy, and Steven? My question would have been, if I respect the analytic department and I take it all in, I still have to be able to make the decision on when I pinch hit, when I bring in a reliever, because uh, it's or else I can't manage. And I wonder if you feel the same way that you'll be a part of the group discussion, but once that first pitch is thrown, you got to get to make the final decision on all decisions. Do you feel the same way? Well, physically, there's no other way to do it, okay? Uh, but some of my decisions will be based on some some things that uh, I haven't had the luxury of having in the past. We didn't have an analytical department in Baltimore. Would have loved to have had one. We didn't have much of a Latin American program in Baltimore. We would have loved to have one. So what are we going to do, sit around and get our butt handed to us because we didn't have this stuff? No, we had to figure out a way to bridge the gap. 
you know, in, trying to be innovative. What are we willing to do that they're not willing to do? And um, so I'm going to take it all in. But let me tell you, when the game starts and the uh, teleprompter breaks and the script doesn't <laughs> follow, then it's you. You better, you better be able to do it, and you better be able to do it in a hurry. Otherwise, there's a puddle of you-know-what around your feet. <laughs> Has your view changed, and I hate to bring up a certain moment in a certain game in a certain wild card game, but has your view changed on when to use a closer tie game on the road? Has your view on that evolved over the years? Who's the closer? Yeah, uh, Edwin Diaz. Uh oh, we can't mention well, closers. Yeah. Uh, a hard throwing right hander who's, you know, shaky and he's up and down. Don't don't well don't know him well enough to make that decision. You know, everybody changes. We'll see. Uh some situations, you know, it's bottom. Sometimes you might not put your best foot forward on Friday so you can win Saturday, Sunday, and Monday, too. It's about managing. There's four times you manage, guys. You manage in spring training. You manage in the regular season. And you manage in this god-awful thing called September call-up baseball that hopefully they're fixing. And then you manage in the playoffs. There's four different methodologies. And you better understand that. So uh, every situation is different. So I completely went around your question. If I changed the way I'd look at closers, maybe. I'll look at, you know, the way people look at it, depending on who my closer is, depending on who's pitching. If this guy gets everybody out in the eighth inning, right. that means Johnny never got anybody out pitching in the ninth. Every situation is different. Put so, your best foot forward. Talking to Buck Showalter, the new manager of the New York Mets. You know, it's funny. I, I got a bunch of friends reach out to me. Uh, Robert Wohl's one of them. He goes, oh, you're going to love Buck. He's got a great sense of humor. And I go, I don't think so. Uh, and I'm wondering... Are there misconceptions about you based on your earlier jobs managing and anything that you know you've read about yourself that you'd like to uh, you know, change the the narrative on? No. So 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 you think that everything that's been written or said about me was true? I, I don't know. I try not to. You know, they used to put this big stack of articles on my desk in New York, different places. I stopped doing that because I want to interact with people every day. If I know every little thing that. When I walk in the pre and post game, I just turn the PR and go, anything I need to know about that I might be ambushed on, he said, she said. Otherwise, I, I, ignorance is bliss. So, But I also realize that sometimes perception is reality. And I've looked at some things through the years, and I go, I wonder if there's any truth to that. Maybe there is. And thank God I've had a wife and family that I could bounce it off of, and they're you know, they keep a grip on reality because none of us are that important and so, none of us are that busy. Just so then let me ask you don't, this. don't take yourself too seriously. So by the you, way, yeah. when you answer your question, I laugh every day. People say, what do you miss? I miss the belly laughs I had in the locker room during the course of the day. I mean, there's some funny stuff down there. And if you don't, if you take yourself so seriously, um, I, lo I, lo I love the comedy of a locker room sometimes, but it ain't funny when you're getting your butt in it. <laughs> no. So we're getting Agreed. a softer, gentler, funnier yeah. uh, Buck Showalter than we've seen on TV in your previous managerial gigs. Do you think you're, just based on age and life experience, a different dude this time around? Like, Do you, do you bring a different sense of uh, personality with you based on those earlier experiences and recognizing that... You know, life is short. Let's make the most out of this. God, I hope so. Have you changed? I mean, I wish I oh, hadn't I've pulled changed, that little trust girl. Trust me, I've changed hey. dramatically. Yes, I wish. I wish I hadn't pulled that little girl's pigtails in the second grade. God, <laughs> you know, I, I look back at things. These guys that say, "Hey, I'd have never done. I wouldn't have changed a thing." BS. Are you kidding me? Of course, you would have changed. You know, you would have if you knew the outcome of everything. You wouldn't have done that. Otherwise, you're just stupid. So. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, you would learn from life's experiences, but I don't take myself near as seriously as people think. But I tell you what, I still take the right things as serious as I ever have, maybe more so. Do, do you, I was looking back to five years ago, which isn't even that long time ago, like the team you managed in Baltimore, there were five or six guys that played 150 games. And that seems like it's a lost art. Like last year's Met team had one guy play 150 games. Is that just where we are in baseball, or are you still a believer that, hey, if guys are healthy and they're playing well, we don't need maintenance days. Go out there and play 160 games in a season. Can you see that continuing? Are we talking about load management yes. here? Yes, yes, we are. So, so, so you're you're going to watch the Lakers play, and you buy this big ticket at the Garden, and LeBron doesn't play. You know, somewhere along the line, I kind of go, wow. But we've seen it in they baseball. Get a, do they get a discount for that when that happens? They should. But, but, Buck, we've seen it in baseball where the excuse is, and, and, like, I understand it. Maybe this will be your argument. Hey, it's 162 games. I got to keep my guys healthy. But not that long ago, you know, guys were playing 155 games all the time. So 
I'm just curious if that's just changed and we need to accept it. Or can you see, hey, if Pete Alonso's healthy, if Francisco Lindor is healthy, I'm sorry, can't mention names, player A, player B are healthy, they'll go out and play 160 games. I don't feel the need to have to give guys off days because numbers tell me, hey, they're fresher if I give them an off day per week, you know? Well, you know, players aren't robots. There's a heartbeat to the game. And you got to understand that not everybody's the same. And, uh, you know, you talk about this word everybody wants to use is culture. Sometimes that's a cultural thing. I mean, I would answer that question was look at the, the team in Baltimore with a Mark Kakis and a Adam Jones and a Hardy and uh, a John Scope. You know, these guys, I can't mention names, so I won't. I didn't mention any of those. Please scratch that out. I'm just <laughs> saying it's a cultural thing. You know, right. they're going to follow the lead of your best players. You know, it's one thing I've told guys in the past. It's to the best. I says, my best players don't play the game right. I'm, I'm you know what, and against the wind. Okay? You, you, it doesn't matter. You know, the best players play the game right. Peer pressure takes over, and they follow their lead. So, you know, posting up, as I call it, you know, one of the first things I look at you know, when I'm looking at players that you might be bringing in is games played. That doesn't mean they're playing, uh, to, you know, not enough too much. I think every guy's different. As you get older, it evolves. So, you know, taking in the, the information that uh, your medical people have, the things that players are saying, uh, sometimes you've got to be careful about robbing Peter to pay Paul, but you want to be proactive instead of reactive. You see something coming, and from, from your experiences with the player in the locker room, you've got to get ahead of it. But it's like that guy that goes to the doctor and says, does that hurt? No. Does that hurt? No. Does that hurt? No. About the fourth time, he's going to go, yeah, I guess it does hurt. <laughs> Talking to uh, Buck Schulter, just a couple more moments here, and we do appreciate the time. Uh, the new manager of the New York Mets, you know, you were in a similar spot as Aaron Boone in that you both uh, left baseball and became broadcasters. MLB Network, you, of course, uh, did the work at Yes, you know, following Yankee baseball. And I would think that you would say the same thing Aaron would say, that it gave you a different perspective. You saw the game differently, perhaps, watching it with a uh, critical eye as a broadcaster as opposed to uh, the way you'd watch it as a manager. And I wondered... How, what you thought of that experience, and if anything, maybe the answer is nothing, if it did bring some awareness to the game that you may not have had just because, you know, the tunnel vision of being a day-in and day-out manager. Yeah, sure it did. I mean, we all grow from life's experiences, but it also verified a lot of things that I thought. You know, the, uh, you don't, there's not some battle you're trying to win. You're trying to coexist and have respect for each other and under, have respect for what they need to bring. You know, I wasn't a broadcaster. I was an analyst. They teed me up and said, hey, this just happened. What what happened in your mind? You know, professional broadcaster, you know, I kept trying to hide from the makeup people every day. <laughs> that wasn't much fun. You can't, it's like polishing a, you know, a piece of wood. It doesn't work. So, you know, you bring what you bring. You know, what is it? That's the situation with New York, with our Mets. You know, okay, here's the situation. Let me look at it. What do you need me to bring? I thought, I, Steve, they asked me, what is my vision for the Mets? And, and I said, well, I've got this, Steve, what do you want to be about? And Steve was eloquent and passionate and really, I mean, really tugged my heart the way he, he went about talking about the Mets and what he, you know, it was all about the fans. Obviously, you know, he doesn't need the aggravation if it doesn't work. He wants, he wants to deliver something for the people of New York and the Mets fans. And that's, let's face it, when both teams are good in New York, it's a, it's a lot more fun. I could care less what happens over on the other side of town. I got, just tunnel vision about the Mets. So what they do sure. and how they do it, God bless them. And by the way, when you go to Steve Cohen's house, um, is there a menu you choose from, or does he tell you what you're eating? Oh, uh, we didn't eat. We were talking baseball. We didn't have time. Wow, for no talking food. baseball, like no strawberries, huh. a dip, a cracker. I did. I did get a cup of coffee out of it and a good <laughs> COVID test. <laughs> <laughs> do you feel as if there's unfinished business? Twenty six years ago. You were managing the Yankees. You turned the organization around. You were a big part of it, that incredible run in 1995. And then you move on, obviously. You have different stops in your career. But being back in New York City with a team with huge expectations, do you feel like there's unfinished business in this town? Uh, what's, what's the stock answer and what, what do I really feel? Maybe two different things. I, I just, I, I just want to deliver, you know, I don't think my whole life's going to be uh, this – defined by that that's more about the family and the legacy there you live behind but you know from a professional standpoint 
uh, I would like the Mets to win a world championship. You know, what that means for me personally doesn't figure into it, guys. I really mean that. That's not some stock answer. It's I just, you know, when you get phone calls or somebody from a young player that you had tough love with and now all of a sudden it's coming back to you, that's what you gain out. That's what you love. You know, to just help some young people along the way, uh, don't do, make the same mistakes you did. How long do you want to manage? Like, assuming things go well, you guys are successful, can you see managing here for five years, for eight years? Right now, it's kind of like when the first press conference I had with the Yankees, I got a one-year contract for $175,000, and I told them I was on a a year-to-year plan. You know what? I'm on a day plan here. I'm going to take today and try to make the Mets as good as they can be and then start again tomorrow, not try to get – spread out too thin, take one issue and deal with it. Um, and where it takes you, you know, it's not for us to try to figure out. I'm going to take each day, and um, I'm I'm the luckiest guy in the world to still get a chance to do something you love. I wake up every morning. It's like my dad said, you know, son, jobs with few problems don't pay very much. There you go. Final two things, we'll let you go, Buck. Uh, number, number one, you should know, that uh, Pete Alonzo and us uh, were hosting a big comedy event at Gotham Comedy Club on January 27th. And, well, I guess it would be awkward because you can't talk baseball. You could certainly come and support it for his foundation. And he's actually going up on stage to do some stand-up. So just keep that date in mind, January 27th. It's already sold out uh, over at, uh, at Gotham Comedy Club. And I guess final thing for you is... Yeah, it's interesting here you talk about the love that Steve uh, Cohen uh, expressed to you for the fan base, because that's the thing that we want most. We want people to understand how we feel. And I wonder how you felt when you uh, found out that guys like Adam Jones came out publicly and said, in all my experience in Major League Baseball, Buck's the guy. That's the guy that you should hire. Because that speaks to what you just said about the relationship you try to have with your players, and if you could just speak to that for a second on how much that meant to you. Uh, you know, I heard, I, I made a point, guys, not to to be looking at stuff like that, but along the way, my family did it, did let me know some things like that. And, you know, it, I want to say it was humble. Uh, when things like that come back to you, that, you know, Adam and I had some tough love early on. I you know, remember having a conversation with him. I said, hey, you're going to be one of my best players. If you're not going down the line hard, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have an issue here, and I'll just go home because the best players have to play the game right because you're going to say the right things. You're going to have a lot of stature in the clubhouse because you're a good player. But if you know if we're, if we're going 5-2 down the line, it ain't going to work here for me. So Adam embraced that. Nobody played the game harder in, his, in my nine years there. Um, so for him to say something like that, knowing that we went through some periods where, hey, I need you to bring this. you got to bring this because they're following you. That meant a lot to me. You know, whether it be Manny, who, you know, young love, tough love. I can't talk about guys who are currently playing. Yep, so right. I'm going to leave that if someone just hit me with an elbow. So I'm done. <laughs> you got it. By well, the listen. way, you, you never really got a chance to manage Randy Johnson and Kurt Schilling. You did for a few months. It wasn't real. You got a chance now. Because now you get a chance to manage oh, the modern day yeah, so Randy Johnson. He knows. Buck, we Buck is shaking it. his head. He knows what I'm talking about. You get that opportunity, we, and we, we can't wait to watch we it. We appreciate man. it. We'll see you when you get up to New York and uh, throughout the season. Best to your family. Enjoy the moment. Have a great Christmas and New Year. And again, congratulations. All right, guys. Thanks for having me. All right, thank there you, you Buck. go, Buck Showalter, the new manager of the New York Mets. You know, we can't comment on that. I was giving him a comment for him to digest. Yeah, he he's never already digested. Got, I think he took the he job. He never got that full shot. They traded for Schilling late in 2000. They he lost his job at the end of the year. They hired Bob Brenly, and he had to watch Kurt Schilling and Randy Johnson dominate. That's the creme de la creme of our era in terms of two dominant, unbelievable aces. And now he's got a chance to manage them, assuming they're healthy. We'll get your take on oh, it. Yeah. It's Carton Roberts. You're a Met fan. Did you like it? Did you like what he had to say? Does that make... 